So, Jeremy, we're kind of in, may not be in a recession right now. Um, Microsoft have just laid, uh, announced their 10,000 staff layoffs. Um, technically, we're not in a recession because the economy grew by a whopping 0.1% in November because there was a World Cup on. Um, but... Ah, okay, that's still, the reason. <laughs> yeah, but still... Um, Companies are struggling to um, recruit data analytics talent, and as a data analyst, even in even if we are living in a recession, um, we tend we tend to find that our LinkedIn in mail is bulging, and we're, we're kind of fending off more offers than um, than we're reaching out to. So, I just um, with mixed signals going about, uh, with mix with a lot of noise about about this area. What's the what's the signal? Is the is the data analytics mid-level and leadership job market can they look poor or rich right now do companies have the power or do uh, do candidates uh for oh, a broad <laughs> broad opener um i i think candidates would have the power if you're looking at, at, at power dynamics um I mean, broadly speaking there's a number of factors around that i, th I think the, the biggest one is that um Unemployment is very, very low within data analytics in general. Um, it, it's hard to put a precise figure on that, but I think the, the UK unemployment figures overall are the lowest they've ever been. It's something about 3%. Um, and with, with, within technology as a whole, I think it's much less than that, maybe about, you know, one and a half percent. Um, so, and, and Bearing in mind, data analytics is probably one of the hottest spaces within technology. I don't know. It, it, it's I don't have the figure because there's not enough good data to be honest with you. But I think it would mm. be, I think it would be a fair or probably a conservative assessment to say, you know, unemployment's at one percent. Yeah. So, well, from that perspective, what, so what's white partners? I suppose anecdotal data on this. Are you getting more phone calls inbound from? people wanting jobs or are you getting more from people wanting to hire um well if, if you look at if you look at the data so i mean candidate pause a kind of relative term it depends how you define it if you look at the data in most areas of data analysis that there are more there are more individuals doing a job than there are vacancies for that job so in that yeah. sense there's not a talent shortage or it's not candidate poor but the devil's in the detail you, you could argue it's candidate poor because let, let's say, I mean, we did some basic SWOT analysis on this and, um, you know, the th this data isn't proven, but it was our kind of SWOT analysis, which was something, uh, taking data science as a skill set, as something um, we estimated around 30,000 folks in the UK that would identify as being a data scientist of some kind. Um, and there was around about 5,000 jobs being advertised identifying as a data scientist with it with within data engineering that's that's a lot closer i think it was about two to one but the point is in both um in both skill sets there are more individuals than there are roles so in that sense it's not candidate poor but i think as i say the devil's in the detail and it's all about the context the context of it is is that most folks are in jobs so if you're going out to the market to hire you're not going out to a market where you've got you know, a whole multitude of, of folks who are actively looking for work. So mm. I think that's why companies struggle with just, you know, putting a job advert out and perhaps they expect that, you know, they're going to get a whole influx of uh, well-qualified candidates. It doesn't work that way. Um, okay. As I say, broadly speaking, because unemployment's very yeah. low, most people are in, in good jobs. Okay, and when, and when a company puts out a uh, an advert trying to get trying to get interested and trying to get candidates. What what are the most common mistakes they're making? What are the most um, what are the most obvious red flags on a job spec from a company that um that that tells you they're not going to fill this role in six months? Um well I th I think in in general I think um the, the, the strategy of most companies strategy is well we'll put out a job advert and you know hopefully we'll get some great applicants that's mm. that's kind of it and i think in reference to what i was saying before i think that is 
uh, a strategy that doesn't work most of the time, as I say, because essentially what you're doing, you, you're, you're trying, you're, you're hoping that the Muhammad is going to come to the mountain. If we put a job out of that, we're just going to get a load of influx of our of, of exact candidates we want. But because people are in jobs, they're not going to apply to the adverts. Certainly not the the individuals that you're after. So you have to sort of um, you know bring the mountain to Muhammad, mm. so to speak. In that you, a better strategy for most businesses is actually identifying a talent pool of individuals that they're interested in, understanding what's important for those individuals and then targeting a message directly to those individuals for, for a leadership hire it's um but, but there's a number of things i mean you've got to start at the at the success criteria i think that's that's what a lot of companies don't do it's actually what, what are the success criteria of this leader and his team what is it that we're trying to affect in the business you know, be that, is that, are we trying to acquire more customers? Are we trying to increase revenue? Are we trying to improve operationally? If so, mm. by how much? What are the percentages? So what what are those success metrics? Um, yes. You know, those metrics might be more vague than that. They might just be, well, you know, we're, we're trying to give our, our hiring man our managers within the business uh, the ability to take better decisions. And, that, and that's fine mm. as well. It's a bit more vague, but certainly you, you can put metrics around that as well. So it's like, what are those metrics? And based on those metrics, what kind of leader do we need to hire? Yeah, I, let, I think let's, in my let, let's, yeah. mm, sorry, in on. my experience as a um, as a data analyst and someone working in in teams and seeing leaders being hired and come and go, um, a lot of companies think they're doing that. So they they think that they uh, they they hire a a new head of data in mind to maybe sort out a migration project. To move all the uh, all the email marketing data onto new SP, for instance, or to implement a new CRM, or to build a specific body of reports for new compliance um, regulations they need to adopt. But then the data the data analyst lead, analytics leader comes in well suited to that and believing they're going to be doing it. But then there are a lot of other things are expected of them as well, which maybe they didn't know about or. Um, the uh, the company weren't quite honest with them about, so they might be expected to kind of maintain. Um, so it, so if your if your focus is building is uh, increasing business intelligence, they'll they'll be expected to to run operational shadow IT as well. So as a um, mm -hmm. which can frustrate frustrate that um, frustrates data analytics leaders once they're in the job, and so kind of like as a um, as an executive search and recruitment expert, how do you help try and steer companies away from doing that and trying to steer them towards being as honest as possible as they, um, well um, well a, a lot of the work that we do is not uh, particularly on leadership highs a lot of the work that we do is not recruiting it's kind of it's kind of consulting and, and getting a company ready to recruit mm -hmm. and i think it's something you touched on off camera which was about you know red flags that that we see that might indicate a job's not going to get filled for a long time or that the individual's not going to last that long in in the job and we see those red flags all the time but but our our job and when we get hired by companies typically it's because they want us to work through those red flags with them they, they want that um that guidance on well how they want the guidance on well based on what we want to achieve what what does our target candidate market look like is is do those two things align if they don't how do we make sure we align them and therefore what what does our target candidate pool look like once we've defined that how do we actually go to market to start communicating to that candidate pool with something that's going to be compelling enough to bring them to the to the hiring table so it's i mean th th there's nothing there's no silver bullet and there's no um you know, it's not rocket science, but it, but it's really just making sure that um, you've got all the pieces in place that are going to ultimately achieve success in the role, and making sure that when you go to market to hire that that data leader, that you know the message to communicate to those individuals, which which is going to bring them to the hiring table and be attractive to them. Um, but that that takes time, and that takes. Um, you know, a process often to work work through that to get to that stage. Yeah, and um, I suppose that ties in with 
um, what will soon be called something different, but what's now called your um, data analytics Kickstarter product and strategy. It seems to be like the approach is, um, that you're advocating is very much strategy informs technology, which informs people hiring. Is that um, is that a fair assumption? Yeah, well, that 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 um, solution is is kind of even a step before that process. It's um, uh, designed for often companies right at the start of their data analytics journey. Um, you know, who understand that they've got data in the business. Perhaps they're not sure whether it's managed right. They're not sure what value they can drive out of it, um, but but they think they can. That that solution is. Um, for companies right at the start of that journey and so that that's often and, and often the starting point on that journey is not uh, we we want to hire a data analytics leader straight away and bring someone in on a permanent basis it's um you know it's, it's starting a bit earlier than that and getting some advice strategic advice on you know as you said what technology you might want to bring in to do that um often there are existing people in the business that can can start on that process for you are we collecting the right data as a business are we managing the data in the right the right way you know those questions um need to be addressed for for businesses right at the start but how important is a good or a bad cv um when putting a prospective hire to the top of the list or looking for a role for candidate what um, what mistakes are being made on cvs by data analysts and leaders and what and also I'm interested really in what um, when you're having an opening phone conversation with someone who's pitched themselves to white partners as a candidate wanting a wanting a role, what what do's and don'ts are there to the initial conversation with a recruitment agent? Okay, um, well let, let's take the your, your first question was about C, CVs first. Um, I, th I think we're, we're fortunate that for us CV isn't that important. Um, because we've we've been doing this work for 15 years um so we can decode a cv pretty quickly whether it's good or bad um aesthetically speaking and whether it's been um you know created in a good or bad way is less of an issue to us so i say because we can we can decode it so we can take a, a bad cv and see if that individual might be good for a job um, or equally it could be a great CV, but we can also decode that that individual might not be good for the job, you know, through looking at the CV, but also through the interview process. I think for generally though, for, for candidates applying to companies, they're often not going to have that expertise. So yeah, the CV is going to be more important in that. Well, I suppose that highlights the value I think, of recruitment agents, of recruit of, recruitment within data is, is the ability to make CVs not really matter. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we don't, you know, we, we don't, when we submit candidates, the way we present candidates is on a, on, on a digital portal, which um, a CV is just a very small part of that, that presentation. Okay. So it's a really mm. a small thing rather than the big thing, because as I say, you, you're trying to, you're trying to present the whole individual, but I mean, going back to the point about, they're not going to have that luxury necessarily candidates when they're applying to companies generally. So CVs do become important in that instance and they can even, you know, they can be accepted or rejected prior to even having a conversation. So in that is it CVs become really important. I think, I think the big like overarching thing I'd, I'd say to people is their CVs are too long more often than not. Most people's CVs are too long more often than not. You don't need more than a page and a half and they're not, people lack the sort of um the clarity and impact in a cv um the, uh, and this is generally speaking i think people lack the ability to in a really precise way put across what it is they do that has impact in a business um mm. both, both in the written word but often also verbally as well um so that that would be the biggest thing. So, you know, it's too too much to go into here. But as a takeaway for people, it would be, it would be, and a good exercise to go through is one of stripping out as much of the 
the, the sort of chaff, if you like, within a CV and really boiling it down to um, to what's important and what's going to be impactful. Mm. I suppose um, no, that's 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 all sort of ex um, excellent um, advice and people to take away to um, to implement because I think a lot of a lot of especially people in um, in technical roles like data flood it with skills and um, and technologies that they've learned. Um, and kind of actually bury what they achieved within their last one or two roles under that, and um, get yeah, get the sense that that's actually a good idea. Um, and and I mean, um, and there is there's a kind of a sense of dropping your ego uh, a bit when you're filling out a CV and making sure that you're not putting every technology you know under the sun to kind of make yourself feel good about it. Um, sometimes less is more. Yeah, well, I think it's probably not ego. It's probably the opposite. It's probably more insecurity. I think most mm. of the times so people maybe feel a bit insecure, so to feel they need to like brain dump everything on there, and that's it's it's, it's the opposite. You know what? More than anything, it's just it, it, you know in, in in the in the shortest way possible, just describe what you've been working on, maybe in your last couple of roles, how you did that, the impact it had. Um, you know, a, a good CV really should probably only be one page. Mm. You know, and, and and this is kind of indicative often actually is an indicative thing of, of often the the issues data analytics folks have of communicating with with business folks. Mm. You, you see that as a sort of visual representation in the CV most of the time. Okay. Um, so it's kind of it, it is important because actually if you can if you can get across it in a really precise way to someone that's non-technical, they can see your CV and, and within 30 seconds they can understand what you're about and what you've been working on. You know that's that's a kind of that, that's indicative of someone that might be able to have an impact in in your business with business users. And just I, I do want to kind of ask about the um, the initial phone conversation as well because that is that's the kind of first bit of the relationship that you form with a with an executive search firm or recruitment agency is one will you will apply for. Um, say apply for the job on LinkedIn and then that goes via recruitment agency who are working on behalf of the company. That's one of one of that's one way all they will approach you on LinkedIn and say, we've got this role, here's the kind of salary band and um expectation why you'd be good for it. Give us a call if you're interested. So we then pick the phone up or receive the phone call and have the screening conversation. It's kind of like one kid that's up, why are you looking to kind of leave your current role? Um what have you been working on? What's interesting? Um, I kind of want to know what, what um, I suppose I talk in the language of red flags because there's kind of like a lot of the times those conversations don't really go anywhere and a candidate might feel like I wish I, I, may, I wish my, maybe my tone was wrong. Maybe I said something sick and bad about my motivation for leaving. Um, what's your what's your advice to um, to candidates on what to say in that conversation and how detailed to be and what tone to strike and what to absolutely avoid saying yeah it's it's a, it's a tough one ned because th there's many different flavors of of recruitment uh, mm. and many different sort of flavors of recruitment business that operate in 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 different ways um so so i can i can only speak for for myself and and our business that in terms of what we like which is more than anything i think it's it's kind of similar to the cv thing i, I find the mistake or, or the thing that we don't like necessarily is when someone comes on on the phone and just talks too much mm. and and what i mean by that is you, you sometimes find this you speak to someone for the first time and the first 10 minutes is is them just brain dumping Mm. everything they've ever done in in their career in, in a sort of like a, um you know uh life story kind of yeah, yeah in a life story with, with with no um direction or just just brain dumping with the expectation mm. that, that now i've got that off my chest just you know now you know put the perfect role in front of me and that's not the way to um to, to approach it by mm. any means um I, and i don't think that's the that would be the way to approach it in any circumstances with any uh, recruitment professional or business I suspect I mean what what we like and what I appreciate is is conversation initially mm. you know I want to have a conversation with someone I want to get to know them and I want to get to understand them their situation and, and how I can can help them because 
you know, the majority of conversations we have with, with people are actually way before that sort of transactional conversation about uh, there's a specific job, you know, because actually you mm. can, if you can understand people, what their values are, what their aspirations are, mm. that's you know, before there's actually a role, that's a much better way of doing it because then, you know, when you do get that right role, you can, I can pick up the phone to you, Ned, and say, hey, Ned, you know, I know because we've got to know each other. I think this job would be great for you. Do you want to have a chat about it? So that's sort of um, the better thing to do. And But also it's, you know, I think now from a data analytics perspective in context, we're, we're sort of moving more and more towards a world of, of sort of, you know, no code technology. So uh, as much as the soft skills and communication skills were, were important before, I think they're becoming more and more important um, in the data analytics sphere. So, you know, those those skills um, and, and, and assessing for those skills is something that's really important to us and and also assessing you know, every every client that we're going to work with is going to be slightly different so you know one of the big things completely outside of, of the technical sphere is you know that we always look for is does this individual have shared values with the client that we're that we're yeah. working with you know and and the, and and the way to the way you assess that is just through you know it's through conversation and and getting to know someone in their situation so um yeah, so uh, look, to, to, that was a long answer, but to, to sum it up for people, don't don't get into a conversation, just brain dump everything yeah. you've ever done. That's the, the wrong way to do it. If anything, just listen more, ask great questions and, and treat it as a conversation. And also I think what a lot of people do is, and again, is that the kind of the arrogant, the ego insecurity, maybe, maybe a bit of ego because it's nice because people feel wanted when they're approached by a recruitment agent um and they feel the spotlights in them but also people um i think people a lot of us um i do this occasion is you don't know when the next question is going to come so you kind of feel like you have to kind of talk to fill silence and it's a very good uh discipline to get into is just answering the question even if it takes a hundred words or 500 and just stopping once and answer and not worry about put it on put it on them to answer the next question and um just deal with the um deal with the moment silence which may probably isn't even a bad thing um so a lot a lot of people just um talk, talk to fill uh to avoid dead air as they say radio. yeah um, yeah that's true i mean that, that that's just a you know outside of recruitment that's just still being in a recruitment process i think that's a yeah. life skill isn't it but but certainly yeah. in the context of a, a recruitment conversation if you're if you're in a position where you're not able to have a conversation with whoever that individual is at, at the other end who's yeah involved in that yeah. process or part of that process if you're not able to have a conversation and it's and it feels transactional and you're being made to feel transactional you know the question you've probably got to ask yourself is that a yeah. is that a company that i i want to deal with mm. and, also, and yeah, is that a company I'd, I'd want to work for you know you can pick up a lot of as a as an applicant as a candidate you can pick up a lot of um you know flags yourself from yeah. those initial initial uh conversations the um just your opinion on data analytics board level leadership so there's always i think chief technology officers always um been the longest standing c-suite level tech um tech one but i think chief data officers been they've been very big over the last 10 years and now we're now seeing more kind of chief analytics officers coming up as well um so which is a, i think a good sign that analytics is getting attention at board level but also it is might be part of a trend of the chief anything officer is like which is kind of like um just because and just because you give something board level representation doesn't mean it's kind of get a really advancing in the past struggle against maybe i don't know sales marketing and chief operation officers is just in that context is is it help is it a good sign having more c level representation at um for data and is is if you're a chief analytics officer or chief data officer, is that the holy grail in itself, or is that really a stepping stone to the chief technology officer? I, I I don't think it's a stepping stone to the chief technology officer, but I I do think that smart data analytics leaders um, should think about the next step after the top of the data mountain. So if you imagine mm. the top of the data mountain, CDO, CDAO, yeah. um, I think. Uh, smart folks in data should think about the next step after that because 
you know, to, to what you were talking about there, there's sort of context to everything. And, and most chief data officers, even though there's more and more chief data officers with that job title, chief data analytics officers, most of those roles don't sit, at, despite the C-suite title, most of them don't sit at the exec board level. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we could talk for hours about why, why that is and, and then why the C-suite um, title is still applied. That's, that's probably another conversation, but, but most don't. And, and my opinion on this and uh, you know maybe i should be a trumpeter for the, for the data industry and uh, i'm kind of i work in it but I, I don't think the chief data officer role is here to stay long long term yeah. um i don't think anyone needs to worry i think it's going to be around for you know a good 10 maybe even 20 years but i i think long term i i think it'll um uh it'll it'll die off because businesses will become inherently more data driven and those sort of transformational processes won't need to happen anymore so I, I think for smart and you already see this actually you know the um, really top uh data leaders chief data officers transitioning into different roles strategy roles or you know chief product officer um roles that um you know probably sit close to the business and closer to that exec board or on that exec board so um yeah i guess i just encourage data leaders to maybe think that data isn't the as weird as that sounds, maybe sort of the, the CDO isn't the top of the mountain. 